May the words that are heard be thine and not mine. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, we arrive on the fourth Sunday of our epiphanal season. This season, this interesting and critical time of our Christian calendar, bridging our two most recognizable seasons together. Those feasts, those big festivals that we know of Christmas and Easter. Epiphany grants clarity to the significance of Advent and Incarnation and allows deeper insight to the impact of Lent and Christ's Passion. Most commonly, this season is described as being one of revelations. Yet the mention of that term confuses us with that scary, misunderstood book that's at the back of the Bible. So maybe it would be better if we said revealings, or my preference, happenings. The liturgical and theological connotation is that epiphanies are long expected. They're desperately needed, life-giving. This isn't the garden variety, hey honey, did you notice that they're putting a new target out on 72? <laughs> on the contrary, these happenings are critical. They're vital impactful. In our gospel reading from Mark this morning, we have an epiphany. It, we read about it as we read of this odd encounter between Jesus and a man possessed by what the author describes as an unclean spirit. Mark's eschatology of immediacy resonates strongly in that the audience present that day in the synagogue, but also here in the nave presently. They need to know. It's important. It's urgent. They need to know who this teacher is who has appeared on the scene with such revolutionary and strange thoughts. You can just sense the urgency, the tension, can't you? Now, the religious leaders, you know the type, they're all in a tizzy. They're all worked up murmuring to one another, hey, who's this guy? This is definitely not the way we've always done it. Well, wait till they hear about this at the diocesan council. You may recall last week we briefly addressed the Jewish anticipation of Messiah. Remember, they were expecting a temporal, physical, earthly, David-like king to come and overthrow the foreign immoral subjugation and reinstate Israel to its once and deserved entitled greatness. It was a tactile, literal interpretation of this prophecy. Due to this predetermination, those attending worship that morning could not recognize Jesus as Christ. It took someone else. Someone who was spiritually inclined to see what was temporally disposed or that the temporally disposed could not see. Strikingly, the author chooses an unlikely candidate to be the one with the necessary insight, an outcast, one with an unclean spirit. That's who recognized Jesus. Interesting. It must have been alarming to have this crazy man burst into their midst. But he isn't disruptive. Well, maybe not for the normal reasons. He doesn't ask for food or aid of any type. Because, you know, those people are quite the nuisance. You know, people who ask us for assistance. Those are the ones with whom we do not associate or we apprise them as deplorable. Now, possibly that was his initial intent. And maybe that was a regular occurrence when that assembly gathered. Instead, today, he offers them an epiphany. His possession was spiritual in nature. 
So his sensitivity to such things was very keen. To recognize Christ, he had to be spiritually inclined. He had to see circumstances differently than they were envisioned before. Differently. You all learned soon enough that I love baseball. Love it. Grew up playing it. I love to go to the games and experience it in person. I like baseball. With that in mind, one of my favorite movies is The Natural, featuring Robert Redford as an unknown, undiscovered, and rare talent playing for a washed-up, soon-to-be-defunct franchise and a grumpy old manager being forced out by crooked ownership more interested in profit lines than stat lines. A pivotal mo moment in the film occurs during a particularly pitiful outing when player and manager engage in a confrontation. The manager threatens to cut Hobbs, who in turn accuses the former of never allowing him a chance to play. So in a moment of indecision, or maybe to prove a point, he orders him to be at batting practice first thing the next morning. Hobbs retorts, I've been here every day, and you never noticed me. Well, Hobbs does take batting practice the next morning. And as the balls are flying over the fence and out of the park, his teammates and coaches are forced to recognize him. Someone who had been there all the while. They just had to see him differently. Epiphany is about recognizing Christ. For some of us, that may mean that we need to look at things a little bit differently. You know, it's so easy to see our lives, even our church involvement in physical, temporal terms. We become so accustomed to our day-in and day-out routines and responsibilities that we miss the revealings, the happenings that are all around us. Sometimes it is a matter of good intentions. Cloaked in the guise of good time management and better administration. But spirituality doesn't really translate well onto a spreadsheet or a 30, 60, 90 day plan. It requires a sensitivity to the spirit. You need that to recognize Christ. And that can be a little bit intimidating or even off-putting because <coughs> it is hard to wrap our hands, even our heads, around what is the mystical. It's kind of like nailing jello to the wall. Yet it's the only way that all of this will work. In fact, we are assured of it and assured also the contrary <coughs> if we do not. Paul, the author of our New Testament reading in 1 Corinthians, takes this a little bit further. Now, he is discussing all the fussing and fighting within the church at Corinth as a part of an ongoing treatise on community. He refers to it metaphorically as the body. Now, they are squabbling over issues that, quite frankly, are not supposed to be the main point. It sounds a whole lot like church today. However, this anatomical metaphor is important to remember because Paul believed that we weren't just an organized group that cared for each other, which we do deeply. But we're more than that. We were the spiritual body of Christ. The body of Christ. Wow. Furthermore, Paul taught that we were indwelled by the Spirit. Throughout the Pauline corpus, he talks about being full of the Spirit, invaded by the Spirit, 
And he uses the same Greek verb that the gospel writers employ to describe, and wait for it, possession. Just like the man with the unclean spirit earlier in our story. Wow. Mind-blowing. You know, we often refer to our friends or acquaintances that we might know as obsessed. You know, he's obsessed with work. Or, you know, he's obsessed with physical fitness and going to the gym or his girlfriend or his car or whatever. Paul's ideal far surpasses common compulsiveness Also, this is a greater inclination than just having, you know, a a strong craving for Krispy Kreme or maybe a Big Mac attack. This is inhabitation by a living God. And it requires spiritual recognition. Spiritual recognition. We together become one And that becoming of one is becoming Christ. We together become one. And that becoming of one is becoming Christ. Epiphany. Bono of the Irish rock band U2 summarized it in the lyrics of their smash hit One. One love, one blood, one life, you got to do what you should. One life with each other, sisters, brothers, one life, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other, carry each other, carry each other. We're one, one. Oh, dear ones, epiphany is recognizing Christ. Christ in you. Christ in you. We can marvel at the historical Jesus, and there are a lot of reasons to do so. But until we become, it is just admiration of a religious figure. Christianity, on the other hand, is a spiritual pursuit. It's a journey of recognition, bursting into the synagogue, spiritually in tune, becoming who we are. One. Amen. And now let us rise and turn in our prayer books to page 358. We will affirm our faith in the words of the ancient Nicene Creed. We believe in one God. All is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came.